Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Fritz Mayer, Dean of the Corbell School of International Studies. Uh, and welcome to tonight's Modulus, a conversation with Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser. For those of you who don't, uh, haven't been part of these before, you may ask, what is a Modulus? Uh, so a Modulus is a, a Middle East tradition of a community conversation. And normally we're in person with food and wine, uh, sitting around talking about a topic of, of public concern. So we're sorry we can't be in person, but I, I hope you have a glass of wine and we'll do our best to have a very uh, open and informal conversation with the Attorney General. Uh, let me thank a few people before we get started. Uh, on our staff, Gina Genome, Christine Marchetta, uh, Irene Wagant, and Julie DeWoody. Uh, our dear friend, uh, Judith Judd, who has, uh, is really the driving force behind these modulus programs. Um, thank you so much, Judith. Uh, and, and to many of you uh, in the audience tonight who've supported the modulus over the years. Tonight's topic is repairing our democratic institutions. I can't think of a, a more timely topic, one that's uh, more important to us at the Corbell School and certainly more important to the, to the, uh, to the country at this point. Uh, I guess it goes without saying that the state of American democracy has uh, never, at least in modern times, looked more in need of repair. Uh, we've, we've seen for many years an erosion of trust in our political institutions, uh, ever more extreme partisanship, misinformation uh, promulgated by politicians and media, rising levels of political rhetoric and violence indeed. But all, of course, all of this came to head on January 6th, where we, we had this incredible spectacle of a, a president actively seeking to undo an election and a mob rushing the Capitol um, incited by his words. Uh, and the rest of the world is watching. Um, our democratic friends are aghast. Uh, autocrats around the world probably gleeful. Uh, and the world's wondering whether democracy can work in this country. Uh, and any democratic forces of the same, of similar types are, are at work around the world. Uh, reading today, for example, that the uh, uh, Secretary General of the UN is, is warning about the rise of, of neo-Nazism around the world, for example. So huge topic, just a brief advertisement for us. Uh, um, uh, in, in February 25th and 26th, we'll be hosting the Denver Democracy Summit where we'll be bringing together many world leaders um, from, from this country and, and, and around the world, people like Michael Abramowitz, the, out of uh, Freedom House, my our, our our dear friend Madeline Albright, uh, Senator Bennett, uh, um, a host of others, um, to talk for two days about the state of democracy at home and abroad. So, uh, stay tuned for that. I hope you can join us for that event. But tonight, um, we have a great uh, opportunity to hear from uh, Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser, uh, someone who's given a great deal of thought to these matters. Um, uh, Phil Weiser is the 39th uh, Attorney General of Colorado, um, elected um, uh, t just uh, in 2018, I guess, um, um, and previously a uh, professor and dean of the University of Colorado Law School. Uh, very impressive uh, background, uh, served in leadership positions in the Obama administration as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, Senior Advisor for Technology and Innovation at the White House's uh, National Economic Council. Um, he's been very active in Colorado, co-chaired uh, the Colorado Innovation Council um, here, uh, obviously in Colorado. Uh, after graduating from law school, he, he worked in, in Denver for Judge David, uh, is it Evil? Uh, on yeah. the um, 10th of Circuit, uh, Court of Appeals and two very impressive clerkships in the United States Supreme Court for Justices Byron White and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We have time, I'd love to hear about that experience with uh, particularly Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, uh, welcome, Phil. Thank you so much for being with us this, this evening. Um, really look forward to your remarks. Just so everyone knows, uh, um, uh, Phil will, will, will open with, with some remarks. He and I'll have a brief conversation after that. And then we really do want to get to get to your questions. So put your questions in the Q&A uh, box and we will get to as many of them as we can. 
So with that, welcome, Phil, the floor is yours. Great to be with you, Fritz. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the Corbell School's leadership and a great legacy. This is a topic for us here and abroad, and I'm glad you're having a follow-up conversation to go deep on it. The nature of a democratic republic depends on engaged citizens. When Benjamin Franklin left the Constitutional Convention, he was reportedly asked, what kind of government do we have? Is it a republic or is it a monarchy? The answer, you have a republic as long as you can keep it. Hmm. This is a fundamental question for every generation and never has it felt so relevant as today. Can we keep our democratic republic? Let me start by offering a little bit of a shorthand on what it is to live in a republic. And I borrow this from uh, our former Senator Gary Hart. He talked about four elements and you often hear these phrases used. They have subtle differences. Do we live in a republic? Do we live in a democracy? Is it both? I'll use the phrase democratic republic to capture the various elements of what our constitutional framework calls for. First, it calls for Lincoln's definition, government of the people, by the people, for the people. The will of the people is a foundation of our democratic republic. And as Fritz noted, part of what has been so scary over the last several weeks and months is the idea that the will of the people could somehow be undone. And there's a range of forces and happenings that I will touch on. I don't know that we'd ever seen that quite so plainly before in the United States of America. We took for granted the idea of free and fair elections, peaceful transition of power. Those are not concepts that are taken for granted around the world. And what this fall teaches us, we shouldn't either. Second critical concept that there is a sense of the common good, that people have, as the founders called it, civic virtue. They're not in this exercise asking, how do I get mine? They're saying, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That's the spirit of civic virtue. Third, the commonwealth is the idea that there is a commitment to the collective good. The collective good involves something greater than just individual needs aggregated, but we exist together as a society with shared interest and a shared destiny. And fourth, an interesting concept, resistance to corruption. That is our institutions, the rule of law most fundamentally operates in a manner that treats like cases alike and provides equal justice under law for everybody. If some people get favored treatment over others, that is corrupting of the rule of law. Elections should be decided based on the will of people, not reviewed by judges of political party to put their party in power. Um, and this idea of a rule of law, it kind of runs throughout the four of these, but clearly if you talk about resistance to corruption, having the rule of law honored is foundational. And again, we might have taken the rule of law for granted in this nation, around the world, it's not taken for granted. It's fundamental to political freedom it's fundamental to economic freedom and opportunity. I would say these criteria all have institutional elements, the rule of law being a good example, but also cultural and even spiritual elements. Part of what we are being tested on right now is how committed are we to living in a democratic republic? And as we think about the state of our democratic republic, I would suggest we might wanna realize it's a lot more fragile than we ever thought. And part of the fragility to mix metaphors, is that we are facing a set of viruses that are attacking our politics. This includes divisive, destructive rhetoric that pulls apart the sense of a collective. Um, this includes private interests having more and more ability to undermine institutions and to seek private gain at the expense of any concept of the public interest or public good. This includes the elections that are free and fair being more influenced by dark money and forces that may undermine, um, again, what we took for granted before, which was more transparency and people driving elections. And finally, and maybe most troubling, we are no longer living in a world of a shared understanding of facts. We are facing the possibility that you can have lies repeated and then believed in a cycle that could be extremely destructive. So I'm going to get to a little bit about January 6th in a minute, but I think what I want to focus on this 
talk is not so much how we got here, not so much what the threats are, but more about the cures to these viruses. And I'm gonna tell you, I've got three basic cures I wanna talk about. They're all cures that I'm working to practice and work with all of you on here in Colorado. Number one is truth and accountability. This picks up on the last point about the challenge around, can we get some sense of shared facts? Number two is empathy. And number three is this idea of working together in a collaborative way to solve problems. So I'll talk about each of these because I wanna focus on the cures to these viruses that we're facing. Truth and accountability, and I, I think I have to start with January 6th because that attack was not just physical, it was spiritual. It was at the core of our democracy or our democratic republic, it very self. There was a effort to certify an election and there were people who were trying to countermand that effort with physical force. A Coloradan was arrested recently for attacking a police officer and part of what enabled that was there was so much photographic evidence of what happened that people are now being held to account. This is a test for our political legal system. It doesn't matter what political party you are. If you attack the Capitol, kill a Capitol police officer, destroy government property, we have to tell the truth about what happened. We have to have accountability. And I led a coalition that had 50 attorneys general, state and territorial attorneys general, condemning that action and calling for accountability. That is a commitment to a search for truth. Our legal system provides processes to search out the truth. People can't just say whatever they want. They have to swear under oath. It's tested with cross-examination and subject to rigor. What is painful to me about our post-election process, you had in Georgia, for example, 15 separate lawsuits. You had a hand count overseen by people from both parties of the election, all that validated that it was a free and fair election. But unfortunately, one of the viruses we're facing is leaders telling lies. And what happened in the wake of that attack was an important step towards truth and accountability. Republican senators told other Republican senators, you trafficked in lies. You undermined the belief that we had an election that was free, fair, and should be respected. And you helped encourage this attack through that rhetoric. Will that sink in? Will that moment of January 6th be looking in the mirror and saying, there are consequences to lies. There needs to be truth. There needs to be accountability for people who break the law in manifest ways to undermine our very institutions. It's too early to tell. I'm an optimist. I come by it naturally. I'll, I'll talk about that later. So I do see room for optimism. Having the 50 AGs calling out this as unconscionable, that's important that it be called out that way. As we have truth and accountability, we can't not also have empathy. I wanna talk about three stories here because it's important to have empathy for our fellow Coloradans. I wanna talk about Hayden, Colorado. I wanna talk about Trinidad, Colorado. And I wanna talk about Ordway, Colorado, the last being in Crowley County, the other one, um, South, uh, also in South, Southern Colorado, Trinidad, and then Hayden is located in Route County in the Northwest part. So first, Hayden. There is a coal plant in Hayden that's getting set to be closed. As that plant is reassessed, 50% of the tax base for the schools is evaporating, which means not only are we talking about jobs for people who live in Hayden, good paying jobs, we're talking about their kids' schooling is in jeopardy. So empathy means as we address our climate crisis and the need to change our energy, which by the way is not only through environmental reasons, but economically coal is not a viable source. We have to recognize these are our friends and neighbors and fellow Coloradans. They grew up in this world in many cases and it's changing and we need to care about their future. There's a phrase that's been used and it needs to be more than a slogan, just transition. It's a moral imperative that we not allow people to be abandoned. Because I will tell you, when you look back at globalization from the 1990s, 2000s, in the last decade of the 
tens, a lot of times jobs were shipped overseas because it might have been cheaper. And there wasn't a lot of attention paid to the communities that were affected. And that has left many communities ridden with pain, with economic loss, with a rising opioid epidemic, and with young people not necessarily want to stay in those communities. I don't want to see that happen to Hayden, Colorado, which is a important and beautiful community. Number two, Trinidad, Colorado. Trinidad, Colorado is a beautiful part of our state. As you drive down on the way to New Mexico, some people have visited it. It's having a cultural renaissance right now. It also is notable because from 1928 until 2016, they were a reliable democratic stronghold. They hadn't voted Republican for president. That changed in 2016. Because Trinidad, Colorado, like some other more rural parts of our state, was suffering and facing challenges and didn't believe that the Democratic Party was speaking to them. And that belief that they were being left behind is a belief that, fact, frankly, had some foundation to it. When I went to Trinidad, they point out that they have a housing crisis there that they believe has been ignored. What happens is people leave housing behind. It's becoming dilapidated. No one rehabilitates it because it may have asbestos in it, which is too expensive to test for and remediate. So then maybe a drug user moves in and it becomes blighted. And that has been building over years and years and years. And they said, no one's addressed it. So when I became attorney general, I looked at a housing fund that we had gotten from this mortgage foreclosure settlement. And I said, how much of that money went south of Pueblo? None of it. Trinidad had been left behind. So working with the community colleges in Trinidad, in Otero, and in Lamar, we set up a program to train professionals to work on rehabilitating housing, addressing the fact that this part of our state had critical needs that couldn't be ignored. And finally, in the most painful of these three stories is Crowley County. If you went back to 1975, Crowley County had a vibrant sugar beet industry. It was the number one source of economic activity. In the 80s, as that industry went downhill, the farmers ended up having their water rights being aggregated and sold to Colorado Springs. Crowley County lost 95% of their water rights. That industry no longer is present. Their number one source of jobs is prisons. Crowley County is now one of the top 10 counties nationwide per capita deaths from COVID. Number one per capita deaths in Colorado. Crowley County is suffering, like many parts of our state, from the opioid epidemic. And so the question is, what do we learn from? What do we do about Crowley County? And the answer has to be one of lead with empathy. If the people in Crowley County, in Hayden, in Trinidad, believe that fellow citizens and leaders don't care about them, that is antithetical to the values of being a democratic republic. And one of the risks right now, as we have more divisive rhetoric, is people are quick to lead not with empathy, but with judgment. That we judge people, that people feel condescended to, prejudged. And we need to work as hard as we can to avoid that risk. Let me close on this point about collaborative problem solving, something I think we in Colorado are very well situated to address. And there's a great saying from scripture, which is you don't have the obligation to repair the world yourself, but you're not free to desist from doing your part. So all of us have to ask, what's my part to help repair our world? And as we look at our world in Colorado, we have numerous opportunities to work together to solve shared challenges. I wanna talk about three of them that flow from my examples, water, the opioid epidemic, and housing. Let me start with housing. I've already talked about the initiative that's going on in southeastern Colorado, happy to engage, talk more about that, get the benefit of people's ideas. That is a major and significant opportunity. There's also a risk right now in the Denver metro area, people are on the edge of their ability to pay rent and are really afraid of being evicted, perhaps through less than fair processes without legal representation. There's an eviction uh, tenants protection project right now. Zach Newman has helped start it. It's a way to pr protect tenants, to give tenants some representation, support at a time when people might be teetering. In our office, we have a similar effort 
around those with student debt, a student loan ombudsperson, so that people, when they're frayed, when they're hanging by a thread, aren't feeling like they're alone. And we need to recognize that a lot of people all across our state right now are in difficult circumstances. The question is, how do we help them? In the housing area, there's a lot we can do. The opioid epidemic. What I've seen in Crowley County, what I've seen in Alamosa County, what I've seen in many parts of the state, is this is a fundamental plague, crisis, epidemic, whatever word you want. It is foundational. When I talked in Alamosa about the San Luis Valley and their economic future, at one point someone stopped me and said, Phil, we can't talk about our economic future until we talk about the opioid epidemic. It is having such a devastating effect. And the sheriff there in Alamosa County showed me his jail where 90% of the people in the jail are addicted to opioids and he can't help them. So we're suing companies like Purdue Pharma who've lied to people, made a bunch of money, but need to be held accountable. And that money needs to address the opioid epidemic so we can provide drug treatment and recovery instead of putting people in jail and help provide education prevention so we turn around this crisis which has hit our country like none other. And finally, let me close on water. In the Colorado capital is a poem, I think from Thomas Farrell. It says, in Colorado is a land where life is inscribed in water. The Crowley County story is a very clear and compelling picture of what can happen when a community dependent on water loses access to water. We have a challenge right now. It may be one of our biggest challenges. Climate change means less natural snowpack. More people moving here is more population. We can't deficit finance our way out of our water challenge. We have to find a way to manage this resource that enables communities like Crowley County to continue to have an agricultural future, which could mean switching to lower water intensive crops like hemp. It could mean finding ways to maybe farm every other year or in certain parts of the county, not others, because we're gonna have to figure out together how we manage this resource. And there are risks that that control of our future destiny could be taken with us if we make certain missteps, allowing, for example, undue water speculation like happened in Australia. And for those who haven't read the New York Times and Denver Post article on it, it is a great primer on this important topic. We have to ask ourselves, can we be a democratic republic of the kind that Abraham Lincoln had in mind when he said government of the people, by the people, for the people? Can we honor the will of the people, celebrate civic virtue, the idea of a collective good, and the idea of a rule of law that's not corrupted in a way that people are treated unfairly. That's the work of perfecting our union, to recognize that we've never achieved all of our aspirations. We've always had limitations. And we've also had an American and a Colorado spirit, a spirit where innovation and collaboration were core to who we are and core to solving problems. So let me end on the note of why I choose to believe. And I'll give you two reasons. First, I told you I'm an optimist and I come by it naturally. Well, on the international front, I'm a first generation American and my family never took for granted what this country has been about, what aspires to be, because my grandparents survived the Holocaust and gave birth to my mom in a concentration camp. And she was liberated by US soldiers. And after the war, this is where my grandparents wanted to be because they believed in what America is about. And when I would ask my grandmother, I called her Bubby, Bubby, how did you believe in a better future during such dark times? She would say, it's easier to believe. If we give up hope, then we are really in trouble. But if we can keep our hope alive, if we can believe in a better future, and if we can look at the arc of American history, which has been one that has overcome dark times before, we can get through this dark time and we can absolutely rebuild our institutions, repair and weave together a fabric which is absolutely strained and where we should be scared, but we can overcome. Well, Phil, thank you so much for that uh, wonderfully succinct and at the same time encompassing uh, overview. And uh, let me just begin on a personal note. I too am, uh, my father was a Holocaust survivor and. Uh, came to America uh, af after the war, and so we share that uh, both that uh, 
experience of, of uh, understanding the fragility and the preciousness of democracy, um, but also the optimism, I think, that comes from, from, uh, from having had uh, coming from that experience. Let me, let me pick up on a couple of things that you talked about, and we, there's so many strands here we could talk about. It's just a, a wonderfully rich conversation. I'll remind everyone that we'll open for questions shortly. I see a number of questions in the Q&A already. Um, you, you, um, you had a troika of facts, empathy, working together. And just take, take them at, at one at a time. We, you know, we agree with the diagnosis of the problem that we have uh, a world in which uh, we don't share the same facts and some parts of the public believe untrue things. Um, and so, um, you know, obviously deeply corrosive for, for a democracy. What, where, where are the points of leverage in this? And we've gotten to a point where there's a media ecosystem, um, you know, not just the Fox News of the world, but, the, but social media as well, in which people uh, are able to get or get information in these bubbles of one kind or another. What, what, what are your thinking about how we break into that and come at least closer to a common set of, of facts? It's a hard one, Fritz. Let me offer a few thoughts. And, and frankly, if you have thoughts on this, I, I welcome that too, Fritz. The first point is there's a demonization and a polarization that is toxic and corrosive. Mm -hmm. um, you heard some of this effort to label judges by their party label as a basis to think we can't trust them. Part of what happened in this post-election litigation was we saw that the rule of law and our judicial system is anchored around legal standards and evidence because judges of both parties rejected these challenges to election results uniformly. I would like to think that has the potential to lead some people to rethink the readiness to discount judges. I don't know if that's going to be the outcome or not because to a point that you and Jan Steyer noted this in the comments, there is a social media ecosystem out there that has been rife for misinformation. And one of the challenges we now have to work through is what standards for social media platforms should exist. And we have the problem on both sides. You'd get something taken down. What if it was taken down in error? How does that get evaluated? You keep something up which might be a deep fake video, which is blatant misinformation. It could be of me saying something that I never said. That misinformation can lead to all sorts of dangerous consequences. So you've got this problem. How do you take something down? When do you put something back up? These platforms for speech have been outside any regulatory oversight, any responsibilities. We need to take a real look at that. I don't believe we want to be in the old world, 1970s, where you had three networks with anchors who everyone listened to and trusted, where you had limited newspapers. Having lots of bloggers and voices is a great thing for flourishing a speech. It has also been a toxic mess in times of misinformation, polarization, and we have to find a way through this because we're not going back to the old world. Right. And there are some great virtues in this new world However, to your point, if we can't agree together on basic facts and institutions that are committed to the rule of law and to finding facts, we are threatened to be unmoored from governance. Yeah, I agree. And then, of course, it's uh, it, to some extent, the, the platforms are beginning to police themselves a bit. But that's also worrisome in the, the kind of power that that they have, uh, you know, hopefully benign, but not necessarily so if they begin to pick and choose. But it is a, a conundrum. Uh, I'd love to talk further with you about it. Let me talk about uh, you, empathy. And you, you um, uh, I'm very interested in uh, something I've written about and, and I agree with you uh, that this is crucial um, uh, that we, you know, that we are able to listen to each other and really, uh, uh, hear each other in ways that we perhaps we haven't done. Um, you, you mentioned some of the rural 
communities in, in Colorado. And of course, there's a big divide between rural and urban in this country and, and in Colorado and, and, and around the country is sense amongst many in rural areas that their voices aren't heard or understood. Um, but I'd note, you know, you, here we are two, two uh, white guys talking. Um, and there's also a community of, of, of people of color um, and others uh, who have uh, always felt marginalized in the society. Um, and I'm, I'm curious sort of how you reflect on the, on, on, on how we, uh, you alluded to the fact that of course we've never fully lived up by any means to our uh, ideals, um, but how we uh, at once address this issue of poor empathy for those in rural communities, many of whom are white, not all, but also for many communities of color and others who have felt historically um, unheard in the society. How do, we, how do we get to a point where we're able to, to, to really have a big tent where we're able to listen to each other across all of these divides? That's a super important question. Part of it has to do with all of us. If all of us stay in our own bubble and are quick to judge other people, we are undermining the very quality that you talked about. I, I'm going to post in the chat a discussion I gave about empathy. I don't know if people will all see it, but it's a, it's a talk that I think is an important concept. Uh, construct rather, which is that we all can listen and learn from one another. And let me give you the idealized portrait of this, which comes from Tom Junod in that Fred Rogers movie. Mm -hmm. And here's what it said. Fred was a man with a vision and his vision was of the public square, a place full of strangers transformed by love and kindness into something like a neighborhood. That vision dependent on civility, on strangers feeling welcome in the public square. So civility couldn't be debatable. It couldn't be subject to politics, but rather had to be the very basis of politics along with everything else worthwhile. And what you got to about some communities of color, I agree with that 100%. I will tell you in my experience, some communities of color and some rural communities share mm. a sense that we're not often seen. Yeah. Our experience, our lived experience is ignored. Our problems are ignored. And obviously issues around policing have come up for African-American and Latino communities. We are capturing some of that on video. Obviously the murder of George Floyd is something that got this nation's attention. I don't know that we've had rural you know, focus on what ha what's happened in Crowley County in that same way, because it's not a split set moment. But mm. I'll tell you, both of these communities have lived for decades with this feeling that in their experience, they weren't listened to. And when I campaigned uh, for office, I heard the same thing in both communities. It's really nice that you're here while you're asking for a vote, but it'd be better if you came back as attorney general and tried to work with us on our challenges. Yeah, well, that brings me to the to the last point of sort of working together to get things done. You know, at the national level, we've had such gridlock for a long time, and and uh, we may again we'll, we'll see you know uh, what happens at the national level, uh, the extent to which um, President Biden is able to move the Congress in in uh, on on the you know big agenda that he has in in front of him. But the, you know the pattern has been one in which. So, you know, gridlock leads to failure to solve problems, leads to disillusionment, leads to a kind of a environment where people feel even worse about government and have less confidence in government. And we've we really, uh, at the national level, you know, all the polls show, you know, incredible loss of confidence in and trust in those in those institutions. You could comment on that, but I'm curious your perspective about Colorado, because Colorado does, it seemed to me, have uh, perhaps a more vibrant tradition of working together. Um, uh, how important is it that uh, you'd listed a number of policy measures and that, that need, to, need to happen? How important is it that we actually get things done um, if we are to um, revive confidence in democratic governance? It's essential. The reality is 
cynicism about democratic governance thrives when people believe government can't get things done. The more people look at government and believe government's not listening to me, government doesn't care about me, I don't need government. All government does is get in the way of my freedom or opportunities that feeds on itself. Part of the challenge, historically speaking, is we're now pretty removed from World War II. So I mentioned my grandparents. You talked about your family's experience. World War II was a time in which people saw government doing great things, winning a war against fascism. The GI Bill giving people opportunity to go to colleges, building the interstate highway system. These were steps, put a man on the moon. You know, Think about that 40s, 50s, and 60s. That was an arc. Kennedy could say, ask not what you, your country can do for you, ask what you do for your country. And people thought, yes, I am a part of this project bigger than myself. They were spiritually committed to that project. We've obviously gone through a period of time and you can date it back to the Vietnam War, you can date it to Watergate, where the cynicism about government has continued to be fed and people wonder, is it worth the squeeze? Does it matter if I live in a democracy or an authoritarian regime? That's a question being asked because people mm -hmm. haven't seen government serving yeah. them well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, uh, well, uh, you, I would love to continue the conversation uh, uh, and monopolize it myself, but let me let me uh, uh, now turn to questions from uh, from our audience, and um, um, we do have some time, so look forward to to uh, conversation here. Um, Tom Demberg uh, writes: the ability of Colorado citizens to understand, develop empathy for, and address the needs of their disadvantaged co-citizens can be assisted by a local free press that uncovers problems and helps politicians develop priorities and garner resources. Can you talk about challenges related to the nationalization of news and insufficient attention paid to local issues in the media? So Tom is, is on a very important theme, and I think you've reverted to this as well, Fritz, which is as you're talking about local government or state government, it's closer to people. The ability to work together on shared problems is much more manageable it's harder for people to see their federal government as a partner in that same way. However, if the news sources are nationalized, but not around the local government, then we learn less about our water situation or the opioid epidemic or our housing challenges. We're less knowledgeable, we're less engaged. The press is often referred to as the fourth estate or a part of the constitutional design, part of the challenge we have right now is the economic models for the press that work so well. I mentioned the golden age of the 70s or 80s. Those models aren't working well in the case of the internet. So there was really a, a one-two punch with the internet. First, the classified ads, which were the economic engine for local papers. A lot of us remember using classified ads. The internet, think Craigslist, destroyed that economic engine. That basically took the legs out from a lot of newspapers. The second thing was other online platforms didn't have the same commitment to truth telling, to an intermediary whose job it was to fact check. And so we end up in the internet, again, wasn't planned, but it's how it played out, undermining these local papers. We used to have two papers in Colorado, for example, um, in Denver, that is Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. Now we're down to the Denver Post. And as Tom's noting, Denver Post has a lot more national news putting in it, not as much of the local reporting. I didn't, I'm not sure, Tom, what the answers are. Um, the Colorado Sun is an experiment using the internet to provide local news in a different economic model. Um, we're gonna see whether that can help answer your question. You can have independent reporters doing their own, but then the challenge there is how do they have an economic model to support them? And how do you know which ones to trust? This is the big challenge of the internet. How do you know who to trust? You don't have the validation of the Denver Post, New York Times, Walter Cronkite, CBS News, what have you, that gives people a reason to trust in reporting. So I do think you're right, Tom, part of the challenge on this point about telling truth, about understanding situations is undermined by what's happened to the media. It's such a complicated problem. And uh, you know, it's always been the case that uh, we, we, we know more about the national figures than we do local, it's almost inverse. Uh, but it's certainly gotten a lot worse. Here's another question um, 
around um, on the media. Uh, do you have any, um, we talked briefly about this, but do you have any prescriptions for changing laws related to social media companies or, or laws or regulations presumably related to the social media companies? It's a really important question. And I, I saw that it came up. The short answer is I don't have a proposal right now. I have the bare outlines of some of the right questions to ask. And the, the two starting questions are, when should social media companies have to put something back up that they took down because they took it down without sufficient basis? And the second question to ask is, when is something staying up that is either blatant misinformation, I mentioned a deep fake or um, child pornography or other what you might call noxious speech. We have to recognize we're dealing with speech here. And so there is a first amendment interest that has to be thought about on both sides. Now, these are private companies who can do what they want, but they are, to use a famous phrase from an earlier case, affected with the public interest. This is the virtual public square. And there have been efforts by governments to say, hey, if you have a major shopping mall and you've got a parking lot, you can't exclude people from political activity on the parking lot because that's part of the public discourse. And what that means for the internet has to be worked out. The other things I would say is we have to think about what it means to have robust digital media. Um, I think this is uh, the good point that was raised by Tom. We unfortunately haven't created as much of a basis for that type of discourse. Again, we're fortunate in Colorado to have CPR as a form of information that's local. They have purchased Denver right um, we should not be taking these institutions for granted. Uh, they play a critical role for democracy, helping to inform and engage the public. And so I think we have to think hard about this new architecture we're living in, think about the important rules of the road. That's something that Congress is going to have to take on. Yeah. And as uh, Selena Whitaker points out, you know, efforts to regulate have, it may have unintended consequences. They may there be other platforms that emerge um, that we might like even, even less. Um, uh, our friend Judith Judd uh, 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 raises the issue of the moment, which is, uh, she says, uh, talk to us uh, more about accountability. Do we need to have the Senate impeachment trial? How does this work with unity? That's certainly the issue, uh, one of them anyway, of the, of the moment. Uh, and I guess the question is, whether it is wise to have an impeachment trial um, or whether that's pouring gasoline on the fire. The, the role of, of the judicial system, the role of our political system includes healing a breach. What happened on January 6th was a breach to the public's trust. The thought that a president could as you put it so ably, incite a mob to attack a coordinate branch of government. It had been something we never thought we would see. We saw. And I am appreciative of Liz Cheney and others who were brave enough to stand up against their own party and saying that act mm. is an impeachable act. And impeachment, even for a president who no longer is serving, has consequences because when Congress passed a law, I think this was after Harry Truman, to say, we want to provide some support for ex-presidents. In that law, there's an exception. Some of those basic supports no longer are provided if a president has been convicted on articles of impeachment. Moreover, there's another potential consequence. The Senate has the ability to say that President Trump could not run for president again. That is, that is an issue. So from a legal standpoint, I wouldn't call this moot. And as for, is it gasoline in the fire? I would call this an opportunity for a reckoning, a reckoning with the truth. What happened? Why did it happen? What does it mean? And can we at least have some sense of collective condemnation towards the action? Uh, there, there is a question obviously that Congress may or may not ever address, which is they could pass some form of resolution condemning the actions of the president. Now the highest form of condemnation is convicting an article's impeachment. Um, I believe, like Liz Janey, that what happened was an impeachable offense. 
And that verdict is one worth rendering as part of the accountability and the reckoning with what happened. And the challenge that we have, and I've heard those calls for unity, is let's sweep it all under the rug. January 6th was not an ordinary day. And the people who acted were people who knew what they were doing. They broke into the Capitol. They assaulted police officers. They damaged, compromised government property. Those actions violate our laws and it violates the very spirit of democratic governance. You don't try to interfere with government's actions through force. So to basically say all the people who were involved in that, starting with the president, but others potentially, we just need to turn the page. I don't think that's a basis to build on. I think the basis to build on is let's be honest. What happened? What do we think about what happened? What's appropriate accountability? And to try to avoid the conversation, I don't think enables us to heal that breach. A related question here from Greg Whitehair, who's really asking, you know, that of course the underlying uh, driver was a belief that the election had been stolen. And, and he's asking whether, you know, this continuing suspicion or belief amongst many in the populace that the election was stolen. Um, you know, do we, how do we how do we address that? And he's suggesting, you know, do we have a Warren Commission? Do we have other processes? I don't know whether the impeachment trial itself may be a, a vehicle for beginning to address that. But um, as long you know, the, the 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 underlying question is, as long as this belief persists that the election was stolen, uh, we have uh, you know, it's an incredible impediment to to moving forward. Thoughts about how, how to get at that? I'm haunted by this question. And at the same time, I appreciate Greg asking it. The challenge is pretty fundamental. The Georgia Republican governor, the Georgia Republican secretary of state, the Georgia Republican attorney general oversaw a presidential election with a hand recount with 15 separate legal actions with all the evidence put out there for people to see. And yet there are people who say the election in Georgia was stolen. Texas filed a original action with the United States Supreme Court asking the Supreme Court to overturn the outcomes of the Georgia election. That was in my mind, a derogation of the rule of law because the rule of law doesn't give the Supreme Court that responsibility. Suggesting it has it is to my mind beyond painful. And that's the world we're in right now. And, and Greg, I'm haunted by the question, how do we get out of it? Um, I'm not sure I know what that answer is. I, I think a part of the answer is the fact that so many leaders, the number of people in the House of Representatives who joined the vote to challenge the results in Georgia, those individuals were acting against the spirit and maybe the letter of their oath, which is to follow and to be faithful to our constitution, which sets up a system for the will of the people to be heard. And that's not something that Congress is supposed to overturn in election results. I, I, I worry that we're in such a polarized era that people are willing to be, in the case of this Georgia example, willfully blind. And I don't know what to do about that exactly. Um, I agree it's super important and it is threatening to the foundation of our democratic republic. And Maybe as cooler heads prevail, as more people are honest, um, there can be some more of an acceptance. I also recognize how much damage has been done by building up this belief. And just to, again, put the fine point on this, when people like Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley, who are extraordinary, I, you know, I, I respect the backgrounds they've had, they are learned individuals. With that background, they said some version of the following, people in my state think the election was stolen, so I need to challenge the results because of what they think. That's not what leaders are supposed to do. Leaders are supposed to be able to be honest with people. And what a different version of a Ted Cruz would have said is, I've looked at the, Je the Georgia results. I can tell you, this was a fair election. There's no evidence of fraud. The fact that we didn't have that is, is beyond painful. Yeah. 
Joe Shaw, I asked uh, just a related question. You know, how, how many members of the Congress actually believe that the election was stolen or is it is it really positioning? And not so this is an important question. And obviously I don't know what's in people's minds. I, I've heard it said among people that a lot of members of Congress don't believe it but they are afraid. And, and we're seeing this now because you're hearing about primary challenges to Liz Cheney, for example, just to give you one no. painful example. Um, and I, I see that fear and fear is a powerful motivator. But unfortunately, if people can't look into their political graves and say principle is more important than my political career, we're not leading. And we need more profiles and courage right now. Um, Reswan Mazud asks an important question. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in 1903 that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Given how white supremacists, uh, supremacists still feel entitled to power and authority where they do not treat minorities well, are we not stuck with the problem of the color line till today? Um, the color line you know, has always been a problem. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, our nation started with what you might call an original sin. Our constitution accepted slavery. And that was a contradiction to the aspirations of our Republic. Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence says, all men are created equal. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and happiness. That equal opportunity spirit exists alongside a dark reality of white supremacy, of slavery, of subjugation on the basis of skin color. and. That didn't end with the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment. We had 100 years of Jim Crow. And once you have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that doesn't just end a system where people based on skin color were not given equal opportunity. We have to continue that work. And part of what is a challenge for us is how do we, how do, we do that work? How do we all do our part because in many cases, these are subtle challenges. Part of what we're learning and talking more about is implicit bias. Um, why are African-American women so much more likely to die in childbirth than white women? Implicit bias teaches us that a big factor is white doctors tend to be more attuned to, take more seriously what white women are saying than black women are saying. And that implicit bias can be a matter of life and death. So that, that calls on us to do work, to do better. And that call is not just a call of the 19th century, it's a call of the 21st century. There's another question about sort of um, empathy, uh, really. Um, um, you know, how do we promote, uh, Anne Rowe uh, asks, uh, how do we promote empathetic support for struggling families becoming homeless from recent financial problems or just low wages or high prices for housing and rent? Part of what I would say to everybody is an awareness that there but for the grace of God go I. If we can lead with empathy and humanity for everybody, that puts us in a position to see people and to ask how can we help them as a fellow Coloradan. Part of the toxicity of demonization, of polarization, condescension and judgment is otherizing people. We see people through a lens that distance them from us so we're no longer shared destiny fellow humans. And, and I think that's mm. gotta be a critical part. And, there's a lot of destigmatization that that calls for, whether it's LGBTQ, whether it's for um, people who may have uh, served in the military and have um, post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of times people live a life with an experience that may not be our experience. Can we overcome the difference and can we listen to and learn from, or do we find ourselves keeping them at a distance? We're just about out of time. Let me let me pull together a couple of questions, really about the you know rebuilding trust in government and, and governmental institutions. Um, you know, one is the concern about the younger people who don't have much trust in in, in government. 
Uh, and the other more, somewhat more pointed trust in, in institutions of state and local, uh, particularly around issues of color again, how can we in Colorado heal and strengthen relationships between communities of color, law enforcement and government? The part of it is has to happen on a relational level where people are learning about one another, understanding one another. Um, in law enforcement, are we recruiting from communities? Are law enforcement leaders getting to know communities? Is there an effort to train people to de-escalate situations so that we can trust that they don't end up unnecessarily in tragedy? And is there accountability when officers lie, for example? We in Colorado have a Peace Officer Standards and Training Program. It's in our office. We just decertified officers for lying. That is unbefitting the profession. So there's a lot of work to do about how we build, how we oversee our law enforcement so that they are trustworthy. And this is part of what we have to do across the board for law enforcement, for elected leaders, for people in academia, for people in public health, we have to recognize we're in a moment where trust is a fragile commodity. We have to earn that trust. And the distrust that's rising against these institutions are a threat to our future. Well, I couldn't agree more. Let me, let me just ask, you know, in closing, uh, talk to, cover again, a tremendous amount of territory and a lot of the a lot of the uh, solutions are at the policy level, things that sort of we need to do collectively. I'm curious though, to bring it down to each of us. What is it that all of us, you know, the, those of us in, you know, here in the audience and all of us in our individual capacities, what are the ways in which we can uh, go back to work as citizens, uh, be a part of this kind of healing process that you're, that you're discussing? What, what are the things that you would sort of say um, each of us in our individual lives ought to be thinking about? Fritz, I love the way you put it. Uh, my call to citizenship for us all would be get educated about what the realities are in your communities on issues that matter. Get involved, work with leaders collectively on problem solving and show up as your best authentic selves, empathetic, listening, looking to learn from others in something like a neighborhood where you don't quickly cut people off because of judgments. 70 million people voted for President Trump in the last election. If anyone says, I don't wanna to talk to any one of the 70 million people, think about what that means. Mm. I would instead say, ask questions to people who see things differently from you and listen. Don't try to convince them they're wrong, listen. And you're gonna learn and I do that regularly and it helps me appreciate why issues matter, what issues matter and how we work together to solve them. Well, um, that's a great place to end. Uh, Phil, thank you uh, so much for your, your time uh, this evening, for your service. Uh, very, very uh, thoughtful, rich conversation. So we're really in your debt. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, My pleasure. Thank Thanks you for all us. for being- Good luck on your it. democracy forum. It's timely and necessary. Thank you so much and good evening, everyone. Thanks everybody. Right.